It is, never mind. Okay. All right, let's let's pray. <laughs> Father, we do give you thanks for your grace to us. We thank you, Lord, for this day. And we thank you, Lord, that you are sovereign and in control of all things. And <clears throat> even the challenges that we're facing, Lord, with, with the... Um, <laughs> With COVID, Lord, and the spread of that, we do pray that you protect, Lord, your people and protect and heal and bring good recoveries, Lord. And um, we just ask, Lord, that your mercy would be upon all who are sick. Many people who have it right now, we just pray for a good recovery uh, and a smooth uh, recovery. And we pray, Lord, that you bless our time now studying your word together in Leviticus. We thank you for your word and we pray that it would be edifying to each and every one of us and that we would glorify you in this study now. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, so we are moving on <clears throat> to Leviticus chapter 12. Leviticus chapter 12, and it's the good thing is it's actually a pretty short chapter um, as far as reading goes, so it's not too much to read. <laughs> but it's also one of the most challenging chapters, uh, and maybe that's why they, the people who put the chapter divisions in there made it so short, because it, it really uh, gives, puts a good beating on women in this particular chapter, at least what they had to go through. Was, was pretty tough. Um, well, let's let's read chapter 12. We'll just have one person read. Can somebody just read the chapter? It's only eight verses. I'll read it, Pastor Mark. Thank you, Paul. The, the ritual after childbirth. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel saying, if a woman has conceived and born a male child, then she shall be unclean seven days, as in the days of her customary impurity, she shall be unclean. And on the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. She shall then continue in the blood of her purification 33 days. She shall not touch any hallowed thing, nor come into the sanctuary until the days of her purification are fulfilled. But if she bears a female child, then she shall be unclean two weeks as in her customary impurity, and she shall continue in the blood of her purification 66 days. When the days of her purification are fulfilled, whether for a son or a daughter, she shall bring to the priest a lamb of the first year as a burnt offering and a young pigeon or turtle dove as a sin offering to the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Then he shall offer it before the Lord and make atonement for her, and she shall be clean from the flow of her blood. This is the law for her who has born a male or a female. And if she is not able to bring a lamb, then she may bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons, one as a burnt offering and the other as a sin offering. <clears throat> so the priest shall make atonement for her and she will be clean. Hey, thanks, Paul. Appreciate it. <laughs> so we're, we're working through now the sections of clean and unclean, right? We, when we finished off with addressing the, the priests and when God had given instructions to Aaron about um, that he was to teach the people about what was clean and unclean and also of the law of Moses as a whole, we then started to work into the, the section of uh, on animals, which animals were clean and unclean. Uh, and so we were dealing with more of the exterior uh, environmental type things that would be, could become unclean around you. Um, these start to get more, uh, more personal in a sense, or more toward the person in chapter 12, and then 13 and 14 and 15, I think it is, let's see, four, yeah, 14 and 15, <clears throat> which starts to get into leprosy and bodily discharges and, and so on. So uh, believe it or not, <clears throat> these chapters <clears throat> do have a lot of good a lot of good for us. There's a lot, a lot of good information here that that's reflective in, of uh, of important themes that come out in the new covenant, and hopefully it'll be a, a benefit to us. So we start today with then with the with childbirth. Um, now I sent I sent out the questions for chapter 13 as well. I think I did that already, so you have some time to look at that. <laughs> um, but we say here, having considered clean and unclean animals and the new covenant relevance of all that we've gone over. This evening, we move on to consider the uncleanness that was associated with childbirth. So what would happen then, just going over what, what Brother Paul just read, what would happen to a woman following childbirth? Claire. She would be considered ceremonially, ceremonially unclean. Yeah. Yeah. So a woman was unclean during a time of child uh, after the time of childbirth. Um, and what did this entail? 
Claire again, or, or or you're still on from? Okay, I wasn't sure if you no. came back on again. Okay. She would. Um, she couldn't go come into the sanctuary. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. She was to be separated, um, right, from the people of God. Certainly couldn't go to the sanctuary. Couldn't come before the Lord in any sense during that time period. <clears throat> um, also, which the, the next part of the question: What limitations did this put on the woman during this time period? Um, also. <laughs> Anyone who went near her, right, would, could become unclean. So she couldn't really be around people for that matter as well. So, so a woman went through a period <clears throat> of time after childbirth that was, that was really, you can say, somewhat isolated, right? Somewhat uh, exiled in a sense in her own <clears throat> area for at least for a time, um, depending upon whether the child was a male or a female, that would, depend, that would um, determine the length of, of time, but she was in isolation, basically, right? She was out, uh, she was considered unclean for that time period. Um, <clears throat> when you think about that, and then when we get to the issue of secretions, bodily secretions, when it talks about, you know, um, how someone comes unclean, if they have a discharge of different kinds, it gets into seminal discharges. So even with husband and wife relations, there's an uncleanness aspect there. Um, even with a woman, right, on her, on her, uh, her, her menstrual cycle, if you think about that, especially for the woman, <clears throat> how often a woman was unclean, right? For throughout in just in the course of a year, you can imagine how how um, just how challenging that must have been. <clears throat> um, you know, if she if she was so, you at least have the one week a month, right? The seven days a month, right right off the bat, and then you have if there's any kind of uh, of a discharge in any other sense um, that takes place, she would be unclean. And then uh, when dealing with you know with, uh, with um, being intimate with her husband. And then if she's pregnant, you know, um, at least for the time that she's pregnant, the good thing is she's not unclean during that time, right? So she has a little bit of a break in that sense. But once she gives birth, there's this extensive period of time where she's unclean, right, um, for a time period. So just something that <clears throat> interesting to think about how long, uh, how much time a woman spent in particular being unclean. All the people of Israel, right, would have been an unclean one time or another. Uh, there's no question just from the, the different kinds of ways you could become unclean. But a woman in particular really had had um, had a lot of time where she was isolated. Uh, yeah, Dave. Uh, well, after giving birth, obviously, the the mother is with the baby, probably nursing and so forth. That would kind of mean that the husband couldn't be too much involved even with the baby because he, he couldn't touch the wife. Is that yeah, true? well, with, with, with the, yeah, what I think with that, with the husband, what he would do is, you know, in, in the case of, of if he were to touch his wife, which he would, I'm sure, to some extent, um, the, I think what he would do is it would be similar probably to what happens like with an unclean animal, you know, in the sense where he would be <laughs> unclean until the evening. So he would wash. <clears throat> and yeah, he would be if a wife, if a husband went to his wife on that occasion, he probably wouldn't be making a trip to the tabernacle right on that on that uh, that evening at all. Right. And so he. He was clean. So he would be with his wife, but there would be also a sense of isolation to some extent, right? For the woman and periods of time where the husband would leave, you know, and go to, he would, he could still go to the tabernacle, make the offerings. But if he touched his wife, he would be right. Unclean. Uh, the child hey, the, and the child is, there's an issue there too as well. Yeah. Why, why was it twice as long with a female child as a male child? We're, we're going to, we're actually going to get to that. Oh, okay. Get to that. All right. All right. Yeah. We're going to come okay. to that. The, the, the real reason for that is because men are better than women. I mean, I, I, women are more sinful than men. No, I'm just kidding. No, that's not the reason. <clears throat> um, we're, we're actually going to get to that. Um, I know the answer. Person. I just wanted to put it to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're going we're gonna to get to that. Um, all right, so, so uh, it was just something to think about, you know, with that to appreciate how long uh, the, the, a woman spent in, in, uh, in isolation in that sense, um, even though her husband would, would be able to see her and would have some time with her. <clears throat> Certainly, even that, even that wouldn't be as close as he normally was, and anybody else would not be seeing her, that's for sure, right beyond the husband. You wouldn't have relatives coming over and spending time, you know, being with her, close to her, that kind of thing. Um, all right, so <clears throat> question number two is going to get into um, some of the questions that we, we talked about. Uh, that Actually, the question that you just asked, Mom, how long would a woman be unclean after giving birth to a male child? It's a, your parents are holding up their fingers. 
<laughs> How long? I think they're holding up seven fingers. No, a lot more than seven. Well, mm -hmm. 33. Oh, right, right, yes, very good. Yeah, very good. If you look, right, um, <clears throat> it says here that she's um, she's not allowed to touch anyone. How, she also couldn't, right, she couldn't partake in any of the, if there was a fellowship offering or anything like that for this whole time period, she couldn't be involved with that. <laughs> but um, it says here that 80, with a female child, 80 right? Days. Yeah, well, with a, with a, days, yeah, with a ma no, with, no, with 40 a male days. child, a male child. 40 days with a male, right? Yeah. But 80, <laughs> 80 with the female. Yeah, 80 That's with the female, yeah. Your, your mother's into the female. the female. She don't want yeah. to talk about the male child. She don't, she don't want to know anything about the male I child. I don't. Right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so for a male child, it was 40 days, right? There was there was seven days um, that was to be in keeping with, with a, a regular cycle, right? Um, and, and then there was another 33 days, right? And on top of that, that she was to, to also be unclean for um, as well. <laughs> and <clears throat> it talks about here also the idea for blood, right? There is a significant, uh, there, there is a significant aspect to this having to do with the, the issue of the blood, right? When, she, when a woman gives birth, obviously she has the afterbirth that comes out and then usually there's bleeding that takes place for several days beyond that. Uh, and so that's certainly a part of it, the idea of the, the blood coming out, the uncleanness attached to that. But, but I think there's certainly more to that, to this as well. Um, okay, so uh, for a male child, it was <clears throat> 40 days. For a female child, it was for 80 days. <clears throat> now here goes the, the big question. What might be the reasons for this difference? What might be, what might you think would be the reason for this difference? Wendy? Would it be because of a pure purification? Purification for female? The males were um, purified because they were circumcised on the eighth day. I'm yes, not sure, but... yes, that's right. That's exactly right, Wendy. Yes, yeah. <clears throat> the both, yeah, both children, right, would be born in that sense unclean. But the the male child, right, the key is that the male child is circumcised the eighth day, right, and so the male child is being circumcised the eighth day is the, the woman is no is is no longer unclean. Uh, on behalf of the child as well, right? The male child because of his circumcision. Um, good, Wendy, yeah. Uh, whereas the, the female child obviously doesn't receive circumcision. And so um, there's, there's the increase on how much time, the double amount of the time that a woman would have with a male child. So the circumcision plays a significant factor um, in this, right? What, the next part of the question, what significant difference was there between the birth of a male child and the birth of a female child? The uh, the male child was circumcised, right? So that, that that's a big, big factor there. Um, and how might this relate to the third part of this question? When do you answer that? Very good. <laughs> the circumcision <laughs> represented um, the child being in that, in that sense sanctified, right? Through his sancti through his circumcision. Good. <clears throat> now, why was, why was circumcision important? Why was circumcision important? But, well, mainly for cleanliness to, to, you get a lot of, um, no impurities maybe in that part and um i think they said that the like the cancer rate in jewish women at the time was a lot less because of the impurities that were taken off of the men also the uh it was it was an indication well the spiritual of, part yeah or separation yeah as the people being separated separated for god you know um god's covenant people clean. Were, were separated from the, the gentiles you know Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were separate. <laughs> oh, yeah, that I mean, was the there, there are health. You know, there's there's always health concerns people address with that. Um, you know, the idea of of what can happen with infection and things like that is true, but I think also even as well as we said, right, is the the, the spiritual issue of that right is what circumcision re represents, right? That's first of all, it's the sign of the covenant, right, which actually preceded um <coughs> preceded Moses, right, um during the time of Abraham, right, is when God had to had the children circumcised. So that was the sign of the covenant that was to give to be given to the male. Um, and that sign represents some significant things, which we're going to talk about as well <clears throat> in a moment. But uh, one of the things, by the way, that Ken or Lisa Kilgore brought up in the chat, <laughs> which is important as well, which gets into some of this as, well, as to why um, another reason for the, at least for the woman's suffering um, or, or being uh, banished in that sense for this long because of her impure being impure for this long because of, of the giving birth is because of Eve right what happened with Eve right part of the curse on Eve was that she would have 
pain with childbirth, right? She would have great pain with childbirth. So there's definitely a connection there as well to that, I believe, to what to what happened with Eve as to why this all comes about, you know, also even the issue of being unclean in childbirth, right? Um, is That has to do with what happened with Eve uh, for, in the, at the fall, the curse that came upon Eve. So I think that's that's good. That was uh, Lisa or Ken pointed that out. Um, <clears throat> good. So if you think about circumcision, then, you know, we, we, we talked about it. it is a sign of the covenant and it does represent certain things. Um, describe the act of circumcision in a non vulgar way. <clears throat> right. We know that with circumcision takes place, they cut off. Right. The piece of a piece of the skin there, the foreskin. And then and then they get rid of it. Right. They throw it out. It's it, they, get, they, they actually get rid of that piece of skin. Um, in fact, there's a situation right with Moses, remember with Zipporah, where Moses did not circumcise his child and and God was ready to actually to, to kill the, the, the child because of that. Uh, and, and so Moses, you know, was trying to, you know, convey to his wife the importance of doing that. And she was she was ticked off. She wasn't happy about that. So she actually took a, a Flintstone and cut it off the child and threw it at, threw the foreskin at Moses. I mean, that would have been a, a fly in the wall scene where you would you'd watch that. And that would that would be an interesting scene to see. And having a piece of force can you know get thrown at you, but anyway, <laughs> um, that that was the idea behind it, right? The cutting off of the skin, and and throwing it out. Uh, <clears throat> what critical message did circumcision convey to the people of God? What was the reason for that? Is that just a random thing that God said? Well, I'm going to differentiate you from the Gentiles. <laughs> I need to figure out something to do, so I'll go down to the most private part of a male. And we'll do this, and that will be the separation. You know, it's it's not even a part you can see, right? In a sense, in general, why does God? What? Why is the? Why is the circumcision? What's what's the the reason for that particular um, use for for God using that as a sign of the covenant? What does that represent? Wendy. Yeah, doesn't um represent the new birth? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yes, yeah, circumcision represents the new birth, right? Regeneration. It represents the cutting off of the flesh, right? The cutting off of the of the flesh and getting rid of the flesh, right? Um, getting it away from you. So the idea there is is the new birth. So that was supposed to be a sign that told the Jew as well, not just that they were different from Gentiles. Uh, it was a sign that kept that that separated them from Gentiles. But so were all the dietary laws. But it was also to to tell, to remind the Jew that. You know, even though they were in the covenant by this circumcision, that this circumcision pointed forward uh, to the fact that they needed to be circumcised right in the heart. They needed to be cut off from the flesh. They needed to be unlike the Gentiles, not only physically, but also in a spiritual sense where they weren't walking into the ways of the Gentiles. <coughs> and so that's really, really important. Um, in fact, we'll, we'll look at some of the texts. Um, that 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 do talk about that in a moment here. Let me see if I, where I have that in one of the questions here. Uh, da, 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 da. I just don't want to. I don't want to double up on it. I think I have it in one of the questions here. Uh, let's see. All right. Well, let's let's look at some of those texts. Let me just see what's. What, oh, here it is. I'm writing the question we're looking at right here. Okay. So, um, what critical message? So that the idea of of um, the new birth. What did circumcision represent, right? The cutting off of the flesh, <laughs> becoming a, a new person in Christ, um, being born again even. What other scriptures confirm this? That's what I was looking for. And question number three, are there other scriptures that, that, <clears throat> that show us that this is exactly what circumcision really means? That, that we see that, um, in fact, it, you see it in the Old and the New Testament for that matter. But what anybody know any texts that actually talk about circumcision being representative of not of the, so much the emphasis on the flesh, but the heart? Yeah, Wendy. They have Jeremiah 4.4 4 in the Old Testament. Yeah, they're very you good, very it? good. Can you, you read, read that? It? Yeah, please. Circumcise your, yourselves to the Lord and take away the foreskins of your heart. The men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire and burn so that no one can quench it because of the evil of your doings. Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> very good one. That's an excellent text from the Old Testament. Right. In the beginning of chapter four, it says, if you will return to me, says the Lord, return to me. Right. Uh, and if you will put away your abominations out of my sight, then you will not be moved and you shall swear the Lord lives in truth and judgment and in righteousness. The nation shall bless themselves in him and in him and, th and in him they shall glory. For thus the Lord says the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem. Uh, and then he says, break your fallow ground and do not sow among thorns. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord. 
and take away the foreskins of your hearts, you men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire and burn so that no one can quench it because of the evil of your doings. <laughs> so you see the picture there, the idea of circumcising the foreskin of the heart, taking out the, the flesh from the heart so that they would serve God with a pure heart. Uh, remember, it, the, the um, city of Jerusalem and Judah, right? Judah and Jerusalem were, were about to um, receive the, uh, the, uh, the uh, judgment from God. They were going to be exiled from their land, from the Babylonians. And so Jeremiah actually went into the exile with the Jews, for that matter. Um, <clears throat> but God is calling them back to himself and saying, look, repent, you know, return from this. He's reaching out to them and he's saying, circumcise your hearts. <laughs> and so there is that that important um, parallel there and recognizing that circumcision, is, that the physical circumcision was something that was the point of the heart. Right. The idea of cutting off the flesh, separating yourself from the from the flesh and serving God right with a new heart. Uh, anybody else know of any texts? <clears throat> that, uh, that Romans 229. Romans 229. 28, okay, well, 29. Okay, so go ahead. Read Romans 229. 20, 29. Yep. Read that. 29 says, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart and the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. Yeah. That's 29. Yeah, that's, that's the Apostle Paul, right? He's showing very clearly... <laughs> what circumcision is all about, right? And then uh, also in chapter four of Romans, right? Verse 12 and following. <clears throat> well, verse 11, let's say. He says, and he received the sign, speaking about Abraham, of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had while still uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all those who believe. Though they are uncircumcised, right? Even the Gentiles, <laughs> Abraham will be the father of all who believe. Though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness may be imputed to them also, and the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but also walk in the steps of the faith, which our father Abraham had while still uncircumcised. <clears throat> so you see that even Paul saying that the, the issue of physical circumcision really isn't the main issue, right? It's not the big thing. It really comes down to the faith that Abraham had before Abraham was circumcised. He was justified before God because of his faith. So real, real important to see that. Um, what circumcision is pointing to. It's pointing, pointing to what God is really after. And only those out of the, out of the people of Israel, right, out of the, all the people of Israel who were in the covenant, everybody in Israel was part of the old covenant, right? Regardless of, of uh, where they were at, they were unconverted, they were in the covenant. But, for, but that circumcision that they received was to point to, um, to, to what was to take place in the heart so that only those who were circumcised in the heart were truly the children of God, were truly the true Israel of God, the remnant, right, that would circumcise in the heart. Yeah, Pastor Doug. Yeah, I was thinking of the verses in uh, Galatians chapter 5 and then uh, chapter 6, but then one in chapter 5, after he's admonishing them about, um, you know, not going back to the law, trying to keep the whole law and all that, he says, <clears throat> for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. And then in uh, chapter six, he says, uh, God, 14, 6, 14, but God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ, by whom I am, by whom the world is crucified to me and, and I to the world for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. So, amen. Yep. amen. Also, yeah, very good. Excellent. And then um, Candle Lisa Kilgore gave us Deuteronomy, another Old Testament text, 30, chapter 30, um, where it says in verse 6, when it talks about the, when God gives the, uh, tells them about the blessings of returning to him, right, when they, when they sin, he says, then the Lord your God, right, will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. So even showing... <laughs> Right, that God would be the one to circumcise the heart there, right? Because we know that ultimately, um, you know, that, that God has to do that, that circumcision in the heart. He has to bring about the new birth, right, um, in that sense. So we see that even in Deuteronomy chapter 6, uh, 30, sorry, chapter 30. And then also I have another text here. Let me see if it's here, Deuteronomy chapter 10. See. Yeah, De Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 16 and 17. Right where the Lord says to them, he says, therefore, circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be stiff necked no longer. For the Lord, your God is a God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality 
nor takes a bribe. <clears throat> so we see all throughout, right, in the Old and the New Testament, the idea that the circumcision um, was something that ultimately was the point of the heart, right? That the picture of the cutting off of the flesh and being separated from the world, you know, separated from the nations in that sense. Good. Very good. Very good. All right. There's, there's other ones too, but that, that should, that'll suffice just to at least get the point across. We see that the importance of circumcision. <clears throat> now, how about this? This is what's interesting too, if you think about it. In light of the answers to question number three, <clears throat> What is the spiritual significance of a male child being circumcised on the eighth day? Now, before you answer that, um, now some, you know, some would say from a physical standpoint, that's when the clotting starts to take place for a male child. Uh, so that at that point, when they, if they were to get circumcised, when they bleed, they would be able to heal, right? It was the ideal time to get circumcised. So there seems to be a medical truth to that to some extent. But I think there's more of a spiritual aspect to this as well. Um, <clears throat> why the eighth day? What, what do you think it would be significant about the eighth day? Yeah, Pop. Dad. Dad. Um, uh, just a guess. I'm, I'm guessing that um, I see that as um, there are seven days in a week, right? So the first day would be Sunday, uh, th you know, and picture, you know, seven days. Sunday's the first day. Uh, Saturday is the... Is, um, you know, is the, uh, is the seventh day. Right. And that would be, um, you know, that's the Sabbath day. I'm thinking the eighth day would be the start of an, of a new day, a new week. In other words, that's seven days, one week. And the eighth day would be the beginnings of a new day or a new week, a new time, uh, like a, like a new birth kind of a thing. Yeah. Just to <laughs> that's guess. exactly right. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly oh. the re I believe that's exactly the reason <laughs> is that, when you think about the idea of circumcision representing the new birth, right, and the cutting off the flesh, it's, it's where does that take place? Ultimately, right, it's through the sacrifice of Christ, but it's, it's through his resurrection on the first day of the week, or what we would say, or the eighth day, right? He brings us into a new week. The Lord takes us out of the old week and into a new week. So there's new life, there's a new week. And so I think that the eighth day there <laughs> is also significant. It's not just a physical thing. There's a spiritual element there having to do with the new birth. You see that also, it's interesting, because <clears throat> if you look at, in Leviticus, some of these other uh, sections that have to do with, um, with, the, uh, with unclean and clean, with lepers and so on, you'll see the eighth day mentioned in these other areas as well, so to show that it's not just a, a medical thing. In Leviticus 14.10, for example, <clears throat> um, that was the time when the, the lepers, when they were cleansed, when they were cleansed and they were to go down to make an offering. And on the eighth day, he shall take two male lambs without blemish one ewe lamb of the first year without blemish, three tenths of an e for a fine oil, right? And so on. And he was to give this offering up. Why on the eighth day? It had nothing to do with health issues there, right? Uh, we see that though with, with the lepers. And then chapter 15, verse 14. Um, again, when you're dealing with bodily discharges, <laughs> on the eighth day, he shall take for himself two turtle doves or two pigeons and come before the Lord to the door of the tabernacle of meeting and give them to the priest. This is somebody who has had, had who was cleansed of, a, of, a, of an ongoing discharge. You have this eighth day again, 1529, <clears throat> again, for, for a, a woman who has a, a discharge of blood, um, a continuous discharge. When she's cleansed of that discharge, she shall count for herself seven days. And after that, she shall be clean. And on the eighth day, she shall take for herself two turtle doves or two young pigeons and bring them to the priest, to the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Um, so you have this, this emphasis all throughout these sections on clean and unclean, <laughs> where sacrifices were to be offered specifically on the eighth day um also on the at the feast of tabernacles <laughs> in chapter 23 verse 36 um we're told for seven days you shall offer an offering made by fire to the lord on the eighth day you will have a holy convocation and you shall offer an offering made by fire to the lord it is a sacred assembly and you shall do no customary work on it so there's this emphasis on the eighth day throughout leviticus in these different texts and especially with dealing with clean and unclean <laughs> And uh, there's no question it's not just the physical thing, obviously, in these other examples, but it's significant about, I believe, the, the, the new birth and what about Christ uh, being raised from the dead, right? That what we would see as the Lord's Day in the new covenant. <coughs> um, so let's see. Uh, Wendy says that enables the boy child to come in the presence of God. Uh, yes, yeah, circumcision does allow that, the, the boy to be able to come in the presence of God. You're right. And then I have from the Kilgores, Luke 2, 21. Very good. We we're going to talk about this a little bit as well. 
it says when eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, right? His name was called Jesus. So Jesus, of course, himself fulfilling all law, the, all of the law in its entirety um, was also circumcised on the eighth day. <clears throat> so there is that significance of the eighth day there. I think there's definitely a spiritual element um, there with that as well. Um, question number five, then. What did the women have to do, or uh, the woman have to do at the end of a purification period? What did the woman have to do at the end of a purification period? She, I think she had to sacrifice. Make yeah. Two sacrifice sacrifices. For the Lord. Two sacrifices. Yeah. What kinds of offerings did she have to offer? What are the two kinds of offerings? Turtle, a burnt a offering, dove and a sin offering. Burn offering. Okay, yeah. a burnt offering and a sin offering. A One burnt offering and a sin offering. So, so based right. upon what we know about the offerings that we went over, what are those? What are those offerings used for? Burnt offerings and sin offering. What are they generally used for? What is the burnt offering and the sin offering used for? What kind of an offering are those offerings? Atonement? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> those are offerings for atonement. So she had, and when she was purified, right, she went the 40 days or the 80 days. Um, she had to go and offer a sin offering, right, and also an, a, a, a burnt offering, both of which were offers dealing with, with atonement and with sin, with issues of sin uh, in that sense. So... <clears throat> So there's a sense in, in because of her, her period of, of uncleanness um, that there's there's atonement necessary for the, the blood that came out of her and also for that period before she could come back because she was unclean. She had to be. So it's just interesting when you think about those offerings that that were offered. It wasn't a fellowship offering. Right. Or it wasn't a kind another kind of offering uh, that would not, not necessarily uh, have to do with sin, like a grain offering, let's say. But these are actually atonement offerings that she had to offer. Um, so that's important. Um, <clears throat> what allowance did God provide for the poor in this case? Again, what do we see here? What, what do we find? <clears throat> right, because they were to offer yeah. a lamb, right? What, what is it? Right. The turtle doves. That she could offer no. the doves. The turtle doves. Yeah. And the pigeons. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. If, <clears throat> if, if the individual was, was, not, was somebody who was financially um, not able to, to meet the requirement of, of, of a lamb, Right. They, they could then offer up the, the turtle doves or the pigeons. So, so God opens up this offering for a woman um, at the end of this impurity, this period of impurification to be able to offer up. Right. No matter what her social, her financial standing is, he opens up the door for all women in that sense. So it's you see his grace to that end as well. Um, yeah. Dave or Jean, Dave. Um, did the woman actually do the sacrifice or did her <laughs> husband do her? Yeah, we actually talked about this, Dave. That's a good question. We actually wrestled with this in the past about the women being involved in that. And it looks like there's some debate about that. But certainly the woman went to the tabernacle, right? Even as Mary did with, with, um, with Jesus, right? When the days, it's interesting with Jesus when it says the, the wording actually there, when they go to the tabernacle, it says when the days of their impurity, it actually uses a plural there, the days of their impurity were done. Uh, she went to the tabernacle, uh, uh, to the temple in that case. So it's because the because of the idea of the male and the the female the male and the um and her but of course Jesus was circumcised uh, on the eighth day so that you know that that sanctified him but it's interesting that that um that uh, yeah it was it, I I think that that Dave that the woman was involved in some sense with the offering to what extent I don't know because I I've even thought about it even with killing the animal and all that it could be the husband was involved too but there are people who believe that the women actually were directly involved <laughs> with some of that activity because we know that that the, um, the burnt offering, right, uh, and even the sin offering is a very grotesque offering. I mean, you're, you're cutting, you're killing the animal, <laughs> you're, you're cutting the pieces up and, you know, and that kind of thing. And uh, so you're involved with that. Um, you know, I know my wife cuts chopped meat and, and chicken up when she cooks. So maybe, maybe that, uh, that, that proves that, that a, wom a woman is able to do that and not have a problem with it. But it looks like they were involved to some extent. Again, I, don't, I couldn't 100% verify that, but from what I've read, um, on that, they certainly went there. Whether or not the husband helped out or not is a good question. You know, Mark. Just as a side note, that when Mary and Joseph went to show their lowly state, they could only do the turtle doves. Also, yeah, they, yeah. you know, because of their lowly state. 
when they went, when they sacrificed it after she had given birth to Jesus. So see, even she had to do the same thing, you know, because yeah. they're uh, lowly. Yeah, Mar Mary, Mary probably rung the necks of those birds. You know, I, I, you know, I, I could imagine women. Women were tough. You know, women. The women then were tougher than the men today. Let's just say that they were tougher than the men are today. Uh, <laughs> but th that gets into question number six, Ma. What you were just saying. <clears throat> question number six: um, What kind of offering did Mary and Joseph bring to the temple after Mary had completed her time of purification following the birth of Jesus? They had offered <laughs> turtle doves, right? Um, they offered the turtle doves. What does this tell us about Jesus's family, right? What does this tell us about his family? They were poor. Yeah, they, they were obviously not <laughs> in, a, in a, a good position financially overall. Now they were also out of their element, right? They were down, they had stayed down in, out in, in Bethlehem for a while. They went down to Egypt. Uh, they came back, you know, those kinds of things and so on. But they were, they obviously weren't a wealthy family um, by any stretch of the imagination. So yeah, that, that's, that's important to recognize that. Um, how about this question? <clears throat> Did Mary bring a lamb to the temple? What do you think, Claire? Yes. She did, didn't she? Well, Jesus, the lamb. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. It's interesting when you <laughs> when you look at that, when you think about bringing a lamb, they were supposed to bring a lamb there, right? Now, she offered the two turtle doves, but there, this, there seems to be some significance of the fact that, um, that Christ, who was brought to that temple, is also the lamb. Right, who ultimately will, will be brought, would be offered up, right? Later, now he would be offered up later on, but I think there's some, there's some, some symbolic element to that. The fact that they were to bring a lamb to the temple, and she did bring, she did bring a lamb there, right? She brought the lamb who takes away the sin of the world, uh, to that temple. So interesting to think about that, um, that, that point. Yeah. Anybody, anybody else have any comments on that? We're, we're moving ahead here. Um, so Ken Kilgore, yeah, Luke 2 24. <clears throat> Let me just read that. Or Lisa Kilgore, one, one, one of the Kilgores, with the scripture here, where it says here, 224, it says, yeah, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. Um, let's see. Yeah, and to offer sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves to young pigeons. Now here it says, now when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were completed. Somewhere it talks about, there's the word there is used, the personal pronoun there. I don't remember where it is. Um, it may be in one of the other gospels or it may be, in, it may be another, it may be a, uh, a variant, a textual variant. I'm not sure. I just want to see if, <clears throat> if it says that because I found that interesting because there it says her purification, which is true. But let's just see real quick. Yeah, I'm not sure. I have to find that. Anyway, I think it's it's in one of the texts where it actually uses the the plural um, in one of them. I don't know where it is, but I have to find it. Anyway, but but you get the point. You see it there in the text. <coughs> the what happens there with the offering? Uh, yeah, Wendy. That's tomorrow. Wouldn't it be the mother and her offspring? Could they have to be purified? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> That's why I'm saying that in the one text, it mentions her, her purification, but there's another one somewhere where it says there, plural, speaking of hers and the Lord's. So even though the Lord was obviously was holy and was without sin, <laughs> he still had to offer a purification. Uh, the, they still had to offer the purification offering for him as well. Right. Yeah. Uh, Lisa, um, go so, uh, would that be maybe in Matthew, the first chapter with the birth of Jesus? Let's see. Let's look. Maybe it's in there. I don't know. It's definitely somewhere where it says that. I just don't remember. Let's see. Let's look here. Um, da -da -da -da. I'm looking at chapter one here. Uh, that talks about the birth and then it talks about the wise men coming from the east. So um, it would be cool to find that. Yeah, and then we're jumping ahead to for maybe it's in Mark or maybe it's somewhere else in Luke. But I know there's a place where it actually says that. <laughs> Let's see. It's not Mark because it's, I don't think, because, yeah, because Mark doesn't even get into the birth narrative at all. Let me go back to that Luke passage again. Ah. See, uh, the announced rejoice, let's see, blah, 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 the mayor behold. 
Uh, Mary visits Elizabeth, the birth of John the Baptist, circumcision of John, Zacharias. So let's look back at chapter two. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out. Joseph went down. Okay, glory in the highest, the angels. Um, yeah, I'm wondering if it's a... Um, After eight days, she was circumcised. Now, in the days of her purification, according to the law, Moses was completed. They brought him to, to, to Jerusalem to present them to the Lord. As it is written to the, in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or, <clears throat> or two young pigeons. I'm not sure. I know that it's, it's, if, it's, if it's not directly in here, then there's a textual variant or something. I know there's somewhere where somebody had highlighted that, and I saw it not too long ago, too. Where the word there is used yeah i'm not sure anyway but was either it, way the, the point luke what it was 22 luke, luke you said luke 222 20, yeah and the king because i'm reading here is i'm not sure what version but now when the time came for their purification according to the law of moses ah what what translation are you using um i'm not sure what translation this is Okay, it's probably the New American Standard or the ESV. That's that's what it is. It's a different. It's the other translate. Okay, so you have the the uh, the different translation there on that text. That's what it was. Um, I was ESV, I must have been reading. ESV yeah. has there. Has there. Yeah, okay. ESV has. <laughs> so there it is. So you have you have two different two different um, work and probably both. There's probably two groups of manuscripts where one has there. I'm I'm inclined to think it's the word there and somebody removed changed it to to her um, in one of the manuscripts, thinking that that it wouldn't be appropriate for Jesus to be part of that. But if he's fulfilling the righteousness of the law in every respect, it would be appropriate for him to, to have that done right as well, even though he's without sin, that would be my, my guess on that with what happened with that. But I remember looking into that and somebody highlighting that, that it says there, and that's what it is. You, you got it. Um, the, it's, it's the, the different translation. I thought it might be a variant. That's what it is. <coughs> Very good. All right. So we are pressing on here. Um, any, will anybody have any questions or comments up to this point before we go into number seven? Okay, well, let's get that into, into oh, Pop, you got a question? Go ahead. Or a comment? Go ahead. Uh, just, uh, just something uh, that uh, this whole area now that you're talking about, it seems to be, to me, it's a natural flow from what happened uh, when they ate of the forbidden fruit. And when it was you know, when the judge when God judged them and separately, he said to the woman, "I will certainly multiply your pain in mm -hmm. childbearing; in pain you shall bring forth children." Right, and it's uh, of course it's to me it's it's a natural flow from that where yeah. when the original sin came in, <laughs> and we have the childbearing and the pain introduced in childbearing. And then now we've get this part about, you know, the uncleanness and what, how, how long you have, what you have to do and so on and so forth. Just a, to me, it just flows yeah. from, from Genesis. No pun intended. Yeah. There's, there's definitely, no pun, there's definitely a connection. Now, Doug, remember, I didn't say that. <clears throat> it came, it came from my, now you know where I get it from, by the way, <clears throat> but, but it's, uh, yeah, yeah. There's, there's no question that, that, that comes from, from, um, from Genesis, you know, there's no, there's no question that what happened with Eve there, even the idea of the childbirth <laughs> you're bringing now, um, whereas God brought right Adam and Eve into the world, he created them righteous, right? Good, right? We're bringing, you're bringing now uh, a, a child into the world who's, who's bearing the image of the parent now, and is proper, the, the parent is propagating a sinful nature to that child. <laughs> so in that in itself, the, the child, the idea of pain in childbirth, and even the blood that follows and the impurity that follows certainly has much relevance to do with, with the issue of sin, right? Of sin being, um, we're going to actually, we're going to get into that in question number eight in a moment of the, the connection to, to Eve um, and how that, how that, how that comes to play in here. But yeah, good. Very good. Um, okay. So <clears throat> what does this aspect of uncleanness teach us then about the nature of sin? And the second part of the question will, will help us understand what I mean by that. <laughs> What is the difference between this type of uncleanness and the uncleanness that was attached to various animals? So what we've talked about this a little bit already. What, what's the difference between this type of uncleanness and the other kind of uncleanness attached to different kinds of animals that were unclean? What, what, do, we, what, what, do, we what do we see about this, the nature of this kind of uncleanness? Uh, 
the, the they, unclean animal couldn't be made clean. This um, the unclean um, person can be purified. Okay, that's true. Yeah, <clears throat> an unclean animal remained unclean. Sure, absolutely. What what about as to what what is what was unclean in the case of the animals, and what's unclean in the case of, of the of this of childbirth? Right. When you think about unclean, right? Well, both, but in both cases, this relates to. It has to do with how what what relates to the to us, right? To or to the to the Jews, right? To the individuals. Um, in the case of animals, right? It was outside of the outside of the of the Jew, right? It wasn't them personally. It was outside. It was an environmental uncleanness, right? It was it was the animals. Well, now we see sin touching the the, the touching the individual person themselves, right? The woman here becomes unclean. The children that are born are unclean. So you see that idea of it now. It's not just the the environment; it's also now part. It's it's also now part of the person. Uh, and then when we get into the next se uh, ch sections <clears throat> dealing with leprosy and and the secretions and bodily you know fluids and stuff, again it, it's it's something that touches the person. And in that case, every person, right? Not just women. So with that being said, what would this constantly bring to the mind of the Jews? What would all these things constantly bring to the minds of the Jews? What would they constantly be, be if you think about being in that in that culture? They would yeah. constantly need purification. They'd have to. It, it's a continuous. Um, it's a continuous thing to do. You have to, It has to be continuously done. Yeah. Well, they have to. Yeah. I think also the fact that they're they're brought you're brought into this world with sin. You're unclean. You're 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 a, a sinner. You're unclean, and that would constantly be the fact that um, we're all unclean. And um, and something has to be done. And ultimately, there was a sacrifice there. Eventually, the woman would have to bring the the uh, the two sacrifices, uh, the lamb and and the um, the two turtle doves. But it would be a constant reminder of the uncleanness of of, yeah. ma of mankind and how and the holiness uh, of God, the holiness of God, and what we and we and that there has to be um, we have to be made clean. And, yeah. and and uh, and it's through the blood of the lamb and so on that we ultimately are made clean and we have you know and um, it all it bunch, obviously it points to Christ ultimately yeah yeah <clears throat> yeah there's the constant reminder in a Jewish culture right at, in that time of unclean exactly of uncleanness of, of, and of the holiness of God a constant reminder that they were not that they were you know every time they were unclean right they were not allowed to go to the tabernacle they were not allowed to come before God. So that, that would happen often. I mean, there, there were things going on every day that would remind the Jews of this concept of uncleanness. If it wasn't outside of them, it was on them or inside of them or to, or to their spouses or it was everywhere surrounding them. They were constantly reminded of this idea of unclean. And so God doesn't want them to forget, right, the reality of their sin nature and the reality of their need, the necessity of their need for, for atonement, right? Con in that case, constant sacrifice to come before him. So it's reminding them, or should have been reminding them, <laughs> continuously of God's holiness, because now it's, I'm unclean. <laughs> and not only am I unclean, I'm unclean till evening. I can't go to the tabernacle. I have to wash, right? I have to wash everything. Um, I have to wash whatever's unclean. <clears throat> and then if you have something like a Again, an, an animal that dies on a particular piece of furniture, you have to scrub that furniture. Some vessels have to be broken and destroyed. Some have to be scoured. Uh, there's just all kinds of ways in which you're surrounded by this. <clears throat> a woman goes through her cycle. She's unclean. She has to, she has to separate herself. There's a sense of, of banishment there or, or isolation. Um, after childbirth, again, the husband touches his wife. He's with his wife. She's unclean. When they're intimate together, there's uncleanness involved with that. Um, in that, in that, in that process, because of, because of, uh, because this, uh, the, you know, this, the dissemination of, of semen, you know, th th this secretion takes place. So there's uncleanness. If, if a man has a, a bodily discharge that, that he doesn't, uh, that, it, that he just happens, he's unclean. If a woman has, you know, a, a discharge of some sort, she's unclean. You know, it's just <clears throat> everywhere in and out. You constantly are surrounded by this idea of uncleanness of sin. And when you had to give these offerings. The fact that you gave a burnt offering and a sin offering, it was it was highlighting the fact of, of the sinfulness 
of man, right? This wasn't just an uncleanness in a sense where go wash the dishes, you know, they're, they're dirty. This was an idea of, of, of immorality. This is the idea of being not fit to come into the presence of God. They were reminded we're not fit to be in the presence of God. And for, for us to be a people who dwell with the tabernacle here, we have to constantly be reminded of our uncleanness by these means, lest we take it for granted and try to come before God um, in a casual manner and treat him as, as, as common. We have to be reminded. So was a, that was the, the, the life of the Jew, right, in the Old Covenant. It was a constant reminder of uncleanness. <laughs> Think about how much bloodshed they saw with the animals. <clears throat> every single day, every day, animal blood was shed. Twice a day for the regular, just the regular offerings. Forget about additional offerings brought, sin offerings and burnt offerings. Forget about holidays. Forget about Sabbath offerings. Just every day, two offerings are offered, one in the, one in the morning, one in the evening for the priests and the people. Constant, constant offerings, constant bloodshed, constant uncleanness. Um, it really should tell us um, when we see all this that, and, and even this, I think it, it, it falls short. It's limited, right? God has given us something visual and material that we can see this with, but it really is, should convey to us a picture of the reality of God's holiness uh, and the reality of God, how much God hates sin. I mean, we, if we don't see that reading Leviticus, you miss it, right? That God is saying, look, this isn't just fun and games. This isn't me giving you some nice, you know, you know, your things that you can get used to and have fun with killing animals and all this and unclean and clean. This isn't me playing games with you. This is me teaching you something real about my nature. And I'm using things in your, in your, in your environment that you can relate to, to get across to you an important lesson of who I am, who I am. Uh, and, and that's what we're getting in, in Leviticus. This is who God is. Um, and, and this is even, a, a, like I said, a, a limited picture to give us the, the, real, you know, the reality of who he is. So constant reminder. <clears throat> How about the fact that both birth and death had uncleanness to attach to them, right? <clears throat> when animals died or when an individual died, if somebody died in your family and you went and had them buried, you were unclean, right? Uh, a priest couldn't even bury their, if they were on duty, a priest couldn't even be a part of the, the burial of their own, you know, of, of their own family member because they were on duty, but if uh, an individual would um, in the community, but they were unclean for that. So every time somebody died and when somebody was born, you had uncleanness uh, that, was, that was present, right? It was uncleanness with birth, with death and everything in between, right? Everything in between. Um, it really shows you just the, the idea of defilement. And I think it should give us hopefully uh, a tremendous appreciation for the sacrifice of Christ. Um, if this doesn't give you an appreciation for the sacrifice of Christ, right, what will? Just what God is trying to paint here before us and say, look, this is who I am. From birth to death, this is who you are because of your sin, and this is who I am, and this is what's necessary. It should get us to look to the Son of God and, and fall down and say, wow, 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 we, we really are grateful. Um, anybody have any, any, any comments on that? Yes, thank our Father for Jesus. Uh, Kilgore say, very good. Anybody have any thoughts about that? <clears throat> Just that constant reminder in that community, what it would have been like and the, the picture God is painting for us. And, and Leviticus does that in a way that, that nothing else in scripture can do that as far as the graphic detail, right? If you got rid of the book of Leviticus, right? It's a hard book to read in some ways, but it's also a very graphic uh, book that paints the picture of sin in a way that nothing else can. Uh, it, when you see the picture of it, it just gives us a visual understanding that nothing else can. Um, now, we see it all throughout Scripture, but when you see it in Leviticus and you picture that environment and what was going on, clean, unclean, bloodshed, it really gives you that picture in a, in a powerful way of, of the holiness of God and the sinfulness of man <clears throat> and what's required to bridge that gap. <laughs> and, and in the case of animals, it was all temporal. <laughs> it had to be done constantly. Right. It, it was never enough. And it, ne it never really dealt with the sin, right? It just covered it, but it had to be covered again and again and again, every day and again, right? And then until Christ came and dealt one blow to the whole deal and got rid of all the sacrifices and fulfilled it all. And now Pastor Doug and I are eating lobster together. You know, it's just amazing how this all comes together. <laughs> any, anybody else have any thoughts about, about that? <coughs> yeah, Pop. <coughs> Yeah, you know, uh, interesting is that one time my father asked me, he said, he said, son, what is the color of sin? And I said, black. And he said, well, 
he told me about that verse in, in Isaiah. And it's very interesting how that, that you could, when you think of our sins, mm. right? They're not, in that verse, it's not described as black. Mm. It's described, uh, described as deep, uh, deep red and bright red. In other words, come now and let us reason, Isaiah says, right? Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Mm. Though they be like crimson, uh, they'll be as wool. Um, and so the color of sin, in a sense, is, is bright red and deep red, yeah, the color, if we want to think of it in terms of representing or symbolically, right? Or a metaphor or something, right? Yeah, but yeah. We need we need the blood of Christ, the Lamb of God, to take those bright red sins, right, and wash them as if they were, you know, as white as snow and 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 as wool, as white as wool. That's right. And if you think about when 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 Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration, and his the, the, the three apostles there saw him. And they said that his, you know, his white, his face became, you know, radiant. And his, it says that his garments, right, his, his, what he was wearing became whiter than any launderer could make it, right? It was like a, it was like a translucent, bright white um, that came out of him, showed his glory. <clears throat> you know, that, that's the kind of glory he gives us, right, through his sacrifice. He doesn't just <clears throat> get the stain out. Um, he, he gets us to the point where we're, 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 a, we're a glorious clean, like we're, we're bright, where you know we we reflect his glory in that sense, not his divinity, but his glory in that sense. Um, so really profound. Yeah, think about that. Very good. <clears throat> number eight. Question number eight. This gets back down to one of the questions that we were talking about before, <clears throat> that I think is portrayed here pretty well. What is meant by the doctrine of original sin? That's an important doctrine <clears throat> to understand and for us to understand, because there are people who actually deny that today, um, and it's important that we recognize that. We see that very clearly. In this particular chapter in Leviticus, and of course in Romans chapter 6, we see it in other chapters as well. What is meant by the doctrine of original sin? What do we mean by that when we talk about the doctrine of original sin? Wendy? Yeah, it's a condition that you're in. It's not something that you do. Uh, that's since the results of um, Adam and Eve when they disobey God. Yeah. Yeah. Paul? <clears throat> you add to that? I was going to say, well, like David said, in, uh, we're conceived in sin and we're uh, born in to it we're born right. with that nature so and and it's originating uh, with adam and eve it's a part of our genetic makeup yeah <clears throat> yeah we're guilty we're guilty of the sin of adam and eve right in the garden we're guilty of their sin uh and the the, the consequence of their sin is passed on to us that's original sin right so that when we're born right we don't sin first and then become sinners we're already sinners and that's why we sin Right. We sin because the nature is already contaminated because we've inherited the sin nature of Adam and Eve. Right. We've inherited our father's sin nature. And so that's original sin. The doctrine of original sin is that we're guilty in Adam. It's it's through his headship. We inherit his nature. Now, the good news about that is what what is that? What does that also translate into from the positive standpoint? What's the, what's the, what's the, the, what's on the other side of the spectrum of that, that Paul gets into in Romans six, just as one man sin, right? We're all made guilty, but what else? What's the end of the story? Christ. We can find new life in the second Adam. That's right. <clears throat> in the same way, right? We're innocent um, in Christ, right? So even as Adam's original sin condemns us, it's Christ's righteousness, right? That that, uh, that is given to us. It's not like the Roman Catholic Church would say that um, righteousness is put in us and we're justified by how by the righteousness that we live, how we live when God puts it in us, how we live out that righteousness. We're justified completely by Christ's righteousness, by his faithfulness, by, by his righteous living. Um, and so it's important to recognize that you see the connection um, between that, um, the, what we call the doctrine of double imputation, right? Uh, Adam's sin is imputed to us um, and Christ's righteousness is imputed to us, and our sin is imputed to Christ, right? He takes our sin. So <clears throat> original sin um, is an important element of understanding that, right? Yeah, Bosco actually says it in the chat here, imputation, exactly. <clears throat> the idea of putting it to one's account. It's put to our account. Um, we're, we're always, what a wonderful thing for us to remember that, uh, and we'll get to this in question number nine, <clears throat> that that's what 
affects our standing before God, right? Even as, as, our, as our standing before God is contaminated in Adam, and then we live out of that and bear the fruit or the rotten fruit of Adam, our standing before God is given through Christ, uh, through his righteousness, which is given to us. Yeah, Pastor Doug. Yeah, the Ro Roman Catholic Church, which is, you know, teaches doctrines of demons, um, they teach that the original sin is, is taken away in the baby's baptism when they're baptized as an infant, that that removes the re original sin. Exactly. And uh, yeah, that, and were that's the all case, moves. If that yeah. were the case, <laughs> you know, the, all the rest of it wouldn't be necessary to think about. It. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, that what they would say is it removes original sin and that's it. And now you kind of on your own slate after that. Right. And, and whatever you do beyond that point, now you have to, to do indulge, you know, you have to do things to, to atone. You have to do indulgences. You have to take the mass. Uh, you have to do different kinds of things to, to deal with your sin going forward. So Christ's atonement is sufficient for original sin and somewhat beyond that. But ultimately, it's, it's insufficient for all of our sin, right, according to the Roman Catholic Church. So real important to get that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So how do we see in, in Leviticus <laughs> this portrayed? Uh, in Leviticus 12, how do we see this idea of original sin portrayed in Leviticus 12? Yeah, Wendy. Just the fact that the, a little boy has to be circumcised. Yeah. And yeah, the little boy has to be circumcised and the little girl has to <clears throat> add to her mother's right to her mother's. She has to be isolated in that sense with her mother for that period of time. Until they offer the sacrifices, the sacrifices are for both, right? For the for the child and the mother, <clears throat> they're they're defiled, right? On at birth, right? The child. It's not just the woman who is impure in that case, right? It's the, the child brings impurity as well um, through their birth, uh, and that's why there's a difference between the male and the female, right? With the circumcision with the male. So yeah, so that so we see original sin in Leviticus chapter twelve. We we actually see it right there in a very graphic form. <clears throat> that that's. From day one, we, we're in, we've inherited that nature from our parents. Good, good. How ought parents to raise their children in the light of this terrible reality? <clears throat> What's the practical application? And if we know this, if we're aware of this, right? Because that, that hasn't changed, right? Our children are still born in Adam, are still born in original sin. Nothing has changed in that sense. But what should that, what should that compel us to do uh, in our child rearing? Wendy. Well, we can't save them, but we could raise them in the word of God. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> we give them the word of God, right? Which is the double-edged sword, right? Which, which can circumcise the heart. But we, we constantly also do that. We constantly present Christ to them, right? We give them the gospel. <clears throat> so we discipline them. We teach them in the ways of the Lord. We give them the scriptures. And we're providing them well, with that alone, which can cut away the foreskin of the heart, <clears throat> right? Which can circumcise the heart. Uh, and so it's important to see that. It, there's no <clears throat> there's no age of innocence right in that sense right every child is born guilty now god can save a child in the womb he ha we, he's done that with john the baptist and we believe that he can do that um but it's it's a, a child that's saved in the womb is not saved because they're innocent right there's no child that's saved um in any sense because they're innocent they're saved because of grace um it's always through christ's sacrifice and so any so all the all the infants who die in infancy who are with the lord right, are, are with the Lord because of Christ as well. They needed the atonement just as much as anyone else, even though they've not actually committed a sin outside of the womb. Um, <clears throat> so Bosco says, forget behavior modification, but focus on heart change through the gospel. <clears throat> yeah, <clears throat> that's the most important thing. You know, it's, it's a dangerous thing to, if, if all we do is focus on trying to control <clears throat> our children <clears throat> and just disciplining them without the gospel, if we're not dealing with the heart, What's going to happen when they get older is we're going to produce one of two things. We're either going to produce Pharisees who are going to see themselves as self-righteous because they, they, they don't do the same things that others do because they've been disciplined away from that. Or they're going to become rebellious and flee once they have the chance to run away, to get out of, away from the underneath the, the rod of their parents. So the gospel is critical, right, that we continually give that to our children and present the gospel. Yeah. Um, Kilgore gives us Deuteronomy 6. <coughs> Six through eight. Very good. Good text. Let's let's look at Deuteronomy six, six through eight real quick here. Deuteronomy six, six through eight. Yep. Very good. Excellent text. It says here. Um, and these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. Diligently. Right. 
and, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up, you shall bind them as signs on your hands and on the, shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and your gates. <laughs> so, and if you notice, right in verse four before that, hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. Your Lord, your God, you shall love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Well, isn't that a new covenant concept? Isn't that new covenant law? Isn't the law of love new covenant? No, it's old covenant too. It comes from the old covenant. It's right here. And you're to teach your children that right there from the day one. You're to do that. <laughs> this is the reason why Rich Hammer wore phylacteries when he was a kid. He had to wear them on his brow, on his front of his forehead. Right, <laughs> right, Rich? They wear the phylacteries to keep the reminders of the law on them. <laughs> so so uh, that's what they, they, the Pharisees did, right? They had to wear those phylacteries. Um, but <clears throat> obviously... Um, we see here, though, right, the, the importance of being diligent. And that's something that's a new covenant reality, right? We're not in a covenant now where we look back and say, we don't need Deuteronomy and the law anymore. Or we don't need to teach our children diligently because we're in the new covenant. That's not true. We need that. That's an instruction for us um, to do. And we need to teach them these truths um, within a within a context of, of the gospel. <laughs> right. That has to constantly be the, the interwoven in our discipline. Um, of our children should be a constant reminder of the gospel, right? Constantly in there as well. You don't want to get away from that as well. We fall short, but we, we should be striving to do that. Okay. And then the final question here <coughs> for um, this evening, how does the Lord Jesus Christ, who was first born of a woman, bring ultimate hope in the light of the reality of uncleanness to which all these figures point? So we spent a lot of time in uncleanness this week and last week. In fact, everyone here has to take a good shower and and scour yourself down after this because we've been just thoroughly entrenched in uncleanness. Um, how does the Lord Jesus Christ bring hope in the light of all that we've gone over? How do we, and as being one born of a woman too, right? Jesus being one, the importance of him being born of a woman himself. How does he bring hope to us? We'll, we'll close on, on this note. Claire. We're cleansed by his blood. Yeah. Yeah, we're cleansed by his blood. Absolutely. Amen. Doug? Yeah, I was thinking the very last uh, phrase of verse 8 there says it all. If you relate the priest to our priest, who is Christ, it says, So the priest shall make atonement for her, and she, shall, she will be clean. And of course, that applies to all, the whole church. You know, Christ, our high priest, makes his atonement for us and makes us clean. Just says Amen. it all. You know? Amen. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he he fulfills the hope, right? <clears throat> Again, in Hebrews, the 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 idea of these things being repeated by imperfect priests who themselves had to be replaced upon death, uh, and they had to be repeated over and over because none of it ever actually removed sin. Christ removes it right fully for all time. Yeah, Paul. Um, well, I just clicked on, but I was thinking of what your dad said before in the color of skin, of sin. Um, I don't have the verse. I believe it says Isaiah, come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be made white as snow. And that's, that's exactly right. what Christ is doing of what you're saying here. So, amen. 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 That's, that's, that's where our hope is. That's, that's where the, the, the glory of all this that we're going over in Leviticus Every, every bit of it, right, points to Christ. Uh, and <clears throat> you can imagine, though, as I said, if you get rid of Leviticus, <clears throat> if you get rid of the Old Testament, you do lose a lot in the foundation and seeing, seeing how these things build up and, and meet their crescendo and their fulfillment in Christ. <laughs> and even just getting an appreciation for the depth um, of, of appreciation for the depth of God's holiness and uncleanness and sin, you really get a good picture of that in Leviticus. That was one of the things that impressed me the most when I first listened to these messages from Mark Chansky on this book. It just really impressed me with the, the, how, how much depth you got of appreciation for the ugliness of sin and the glory of, of God's holiness and the necessity think, of Christ. Yeah, Mark. Mark, I think, I think you already said it. I, I think you did. I think I heard Hebrews 10, that whole chapter there, you know, Christ sacrificed once for all. It's done. You know, we don't have to continue to do what they did. So we have that to rely on. He's done it once for all. And it's because of him that we can be holy. So, yeah, you know, there's yeah. no more sacrificing, you know, and he took care of it all one, one time. And uh, and our repentance is daily, of course. And he's the only one worthy. 
Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Worthy is the land. Worthy. I want to be preaching on that this Sunday. Revelation chapter 5. Worthy is the lamb to open the scroll who was slain, right? (laughs) Um, Yeah, in Hebrews 10, for the law having a shadow of the good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. (laughs) For then would they not have ceased to be offered? For the worshipers once purified would have no more consciousness of sins, right? If they satisfy. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. (laughs) And he's talking about especially the, the, um, the Day of Atonement here. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. And burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. In the volume of what book? In the volume, volume of the entire Old Testament. Right. And in the volume of what we've been going over in Leviticus, in the volume of God's word, if you throw out the Old Testament, you throw out the, you throw out the gospel, you throw out Christ because it's written of him. And, and you don't understand. You wouldn't even under, we wouldn't even understand Hebrews without the book of Leviticus. We wouldn't even be able to understand this book without these, the, what, we're, what we've been going over. And when you read through Hebrews, something good to do, maybe even afterwards, is to read through the book of Hebrews when we as we work when we finish Leviticus. Um, <clears throat> just a wonderful thing. And every priest, right, stands ministering daily, daily, and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, capital M, <laughs> after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. From that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sacrificed, uh, sanctified. <laughs> The priest never sat down, right? His job was never done. Anyone who was working in the priesthood, who was in that ministry, uh, working as as the priest, when they were on office, they did not sit down. They had to continue to do those offerings. They were on duty. Jesus sat down because it was done. There was nothing else to do beyond his sacrifice, his once for all sacrifice for us. So really, really important. By that, we will have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all, once for all time, right? One time. Yeah. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> All right. Well, we will, I guess we'll stop there. Next time we'll get into the, the section on leprosy, at least the first, the first chapter on leprosy given there, chapter 13. Again, a wonderful picture of there of, of God's holiness and the reality of sin. And just Christ is seen in some, in some profound ways there. We'll look at some of the texts in the new Testament with Jesus dealing with lepers and uh, just see how that relates really is some good material there. So hopefully this will give us, again, more of an appreciation and, and a desire to read, read these books in the Old Testament um, as we study them. All right. Well, let's um, let me stop the recording here.